We're going to get started now. I'm Rick Walters, Director of Corporate Social Responsibility for the Pension Boards and your host for today's webinar. There's going to be a presentation with slides if you're joining us on your computer or audio only if you're joining us by phone. There's also an opportunity to ask questions as I indicated before. Many of the materials that I'm going to refer to today may be found on our website under the CSR tab with direct links. That's the tab over to the right and on the top where it says response to the investment and other uh, general synod issues. Uh, but the other tabs also have valuable background information on our general corporate social responsibility program that might be of interest to you. So we invite you uh, when you log in to pbucc.org to go to the CSR page and you will find these tabs. There are many resolutions being presented at the General Synod of the United Church of Christ in Long Beach, California next week. But today I will only be discussing two of those resolutions and the response of the Pension Board's Board of Trustees to those resolutions. Uh, and just to name those, they are resolution urging divestment from fossil fuel companies and resolution on making UCC church building more carbon neutral. There is another resolution on the environment called Resolution on Mountaintop Removal Coal Mining in Appalachia. I'm not going to comment on that, but I nevertheless commend its reading to you as an excellent example of a resolution that's written in a positive way to welcome and encourage response from all its supporters. And it certainly is a, a resolution uh, to be supported. There are a lot of acronyms that are used uh, with respect to corporate social responsibility, so I just want to uh, familiarize you with those up front. Uh, here are the common ones, corporate social responsibility, CSR, social, socially responsible investing, or SRI, and the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility uh, is the ICCR. CSR can refer to an in-house program of socially responsible investing, such as the pension boards has, uh, or it might refer to an in-house program of a corporation who seeks to have a better self-image or corporate image to the rest of the world by uh, disseminating information about its own social responsibility. But today we're going to talk about it in terms of the program that the pension boards has. The Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility is an institution that we relate to that is an ecumenical body doing the same type of socially responsible investing as the pension boards, and we'll talk more about that later also. Here's an overview of our seminar or webinar today. Uh, we're going to look at the overall program of socially responsible investing uh, that is sponsored by the pension boards followed by a specific discussion of our response to the resolution on divestment. And we're going to end with a review of the Pension Board's plan for future action on climate change. So with that in mind as our structure uh, for the webinar, let us proceed with a little background on corporate social responsibility. What is corporate social responsibility? Well, the idea emerged out of two major areas of deep concern to the faith community in the 20th century. These were the war in Vietnam and apartheid in South Africa. Faith groups across all religious boundaries began to ask if there was not some way in which the assets of a faith-based group could be used to influence or produce a greater responsibility for corporations which profited from war or discriminatory practices engaged in by country, and in the corporate practices of those companies with regard to governance, treatment of their employees, and in their environmental impact. Some say that the biggest, um, uh, that the faith-based 
corporate social responsibility began with the first shareholder resolution filed against General Motors, the biggest American corporate employer in South Africa at the time, asking the board of directors of General Motors to cease all operations in South Africa. The story of that historic moment is documented in a live interview with the Episcopalian church person who filed the resolution, which can be found on our website. You can listen to the interview on podcast, or you can read the transcript, and it is entitled Paul Newhauser, The Beginning of Shareholder Activism and the End of uh, Apartheid. That is uh, the link to our website page that you see on the screen right now. Stockholders who otherwise qualify can file what is called a shareholder resolution, asking the company to take action on a specific topic. And other shareholders may vote for that resolution. Shareholder resolutions, even if they fail to pass by a majority of votes, nevertheless inform the board of directors staff, and other shareholders of a particular concern or issue. Faith-based groups such as the United Church of Christ discovered that this right of shareholders could be used as a vital tool for social action in the fight against apartheid. These groups eventually worked together 42 years ago to form an ecumenical ministry called the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility to coordinate this strategy. Uh, the United Church of Christ and the pension boards were founding members of that group, and it has since grown to 275 members and represents over $1 billion in assets under management. After the end of apartheid and even before, ICCR began to work on a prioritized list of other issues important to the broad faith community and 25 years ago filed its first shareholder resolution on climate change. More information about the ICCR can be found on their website at iccr.org and in a link on the Pension Board's website, tvucc.org. It should be noted that shareholder status brings about many opportunities for changing the policies and culture of companies in significant ways. Many companies today, fearing the strength of shareholder concerns, seek an open dialogue with faith groups at meetings held specifically for that purpose. And these are called corporate dialogues and are an informal means of getting a company to implement action before a resolution is filed. All shareholders also get to vote on every action coming before the company, like voting on who sits on the board of directors, executive compensation policies, diversity of directors and employees, and many other important issues. This is called voting your proxies. Shareholders may also attend meetings to cast their votes directly without a proxy. With respect to apartheid and the effectiveness of CSR at bringing about change, there is a lot of misinformation. It's generally believed that American and Western divestment from companies brought about the end of apartheid. But first of all, before we as Americans or Western Europeans for that matter can take any credit whatsoever for the end of apartheid, we have to give honor and respect to the sacrifice of the South African people, particularly the black South Africans who were killed and wounded during peaceful demonstrations, thrown into jail, endured harsh discriminatory actions, and continued to fight for their freedom. They're the ones who deserve the credit for ending apartheid. Those individuals are institutions that divested American companies doing business in South Africa, did so hoping only to drive them out of South Africa. Those companies could do so and continue in business elsewhere. In contrast, shareholder activists impose what were known as the Sullivan Principles. The Sullivan Principles were workplace principles for companies operating in South Africa, such as no segregation of restrooms or drinking fountains or other facilities, equal pay for equal work, 
and a whole series of actions that provided in the workplace what was being denied in society. The Sullivan principles were adopted by GM, Ford, and Goodyear, the largest employers, and eventually they called a, called a great deal of attention to the treatment of workers in South Africa. Thirdly, divestment was only one part of an extremely sophisticated and varied response of multiple strategies applied by governments and institutions, leading to the end of apartheid. That being said, there is little data to support the impact of divestment on the end of apartheid, other than the heartfelt thanks of the South African people for any efforts made by others to support their cause. Much of the effort to support that cause came from denominations and faith groups who tirelessly used their influence on companies to cease operating in South Africa through shareholder activism, as evidenced by the departure of General Motors documented in the interview that I referenced earlier. If you want to know more about the history of the ICCR with regard to apartheid and other direct changes they brought about, please read the book, The Quiet Hand of God, Faith-Based Activism and the Public Role of Mainline Protestantism. See also, uh, if you want to know the economic impact of divestment in the campaign to end apartheid, the actuarial study called The Effect of Socially Activist Investment Policies on the Financial Markets, Evidence from the South African Boycott. Today, the pension boards continues to be engaged in a vital program of shareholder action on issues identified by General Synod and other parts of the church by active participation in ICCR and directly. A current example is an initiative to change the policies of American-based garment companies related to working conditions and safety in foreign plants, like the one that collapsed recently in Bangladesh. The pension board signed on to a letter along with the United Church Funds that also has an active CSR program of its own and hundreds of other faith-based partners calling for stricter standards for garment companies doing business overseas. You can see details of that effort on our website in a link entitled PBUCC Joins ICCR, Faith-Based Investors in Calling for Worker Safety. The pension boards through participation in the ICCR has, as we said, in responding to the issue of climate change and other environmental issues for over 25 years. And this history, as well as some of the positive results of those efforts, are documented in examples given in a link on our website entitled Overview of Key Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, Shareholder Resolutions on Climate Change. Now, the print on this slide is a little small, so you may want to go directly to the website at your convenience to review this important history. Sometimes people ask me, well, how do you measure the effectiveness of shareholder activism? And one way that we measure that is by seeing the increase in the percentage of shareholders that are voting on our sponsored resolutions. These have been increasing steadily over the last few years, and what that tells us is that we're not only influencing the uh, corporate leadership of the companies that we're invested in, but we're having an effect on the shareholders, the actual owners of the company, and that's an important link that others often overlook. Now, there are some who are critical of the strategy of shareholder activism as an effective tool in the fight over climate change. That criticism is, of course, welcomed, as long as the same critical reflection can be applied to all strategies in the fight over climate change, including divestment. But we should consider this. A strategy should not be confused with the issue itself, nor should we criticize the zeal sincerity, authenticity of ministry, and call of those who pursue, pursue one strategy over another. Otherwise, we as a people of faith put ourselves in a position of tearing down each other's legitimate ministry 
in the name of pursuing the important goal of addressing social justice issues that we all agree on. The issue in this particular resolution on divestment is climate change. We need to distinguish climate change from the method that we use to address that issue, and that is shareholder activism. Divestment is also a strategy, and it is the principal, if not exclusive, strategy of the resolution. So we want people to know that we are concerned about the issue of climate change and that we want to do something about it, but that shareholder activism is our preferred strategy. As I mentioned before, there are three basic resolutions on the environment, which you can see on the screen there, and you can find the text of those resolutions on the UCC website, ucc.org. You click on the tab for General Synod, and it will take you to the texts of the various resolutions that are being presented and which delegates will be voting on next week. Now that we've established some background, let us summarize a bit with a series of statements important to an understanding of why the pension boards is responding to two of the resolutions at Senate dealing with environment. First of all, the pension boards is an affiliated ministry of the United Church of Christ, which means that it is part of the whole witness and ministry of the UCC, but independent and managed by a separate board of trustees. Those who came before us in the United Church of Christ and established the pension boards set it up in this way just so that it could protect the assets of our clergy and lay church worker retirees. Second, the pension boards strives to respond faithfully to and upon occasion initiate social justice actions important to the whole UCC and ecumenical community, including action on climate change and other environmental issues. Third, the pension board accomplishes this call to action through a historic, systematic, and wholly ecumenical strategy of shareholder activism, both because it is effective and because it best fits with our most important goal of serving our members and beneficiaries of retirement benefits with excellence and it's in compliance with our legal and moral responsibilities to our members. You may have noticed an additional element of background for your understanding of our overall CSR approach in that third statement, and that is our call purpose as an organization that has served our retired, our retired and retiring clergy and lay workers for over a century. Our pension boards is responsible for managing, caring for, and distributing the earned assets of our members and annuitants, which is held in a sacred and legal trust for their benefit when they retire. That trust places moral and legal restrictions on how we invest those funds and how those investments may be managed and used. Every dollar under management at the pension boards has a person's name on it. And one of those persons is you, if you are a member tuned into this webinar. You have a right to expect, as the laws governing pension, pension plans were meant to protect, the integrity and prudent and wise management of those assets on your behalf. Members often contact the pension boards for information. In fact, our staff responds to an average of 85 calls per day, each and every day. I wish that more of them asked about our CSR program in the subject of this webinar, but most of them ask, well, how is my pension doing? Or what will my benefit be when I retire? Of course, the importance, validity, and urgency of the pension board's response to climate change is also asked about from time to time from those concerned that the pension board is investing in a way that is socially responsible. To those questions, we answer that there are some things that we can do and some things that we cannot do to respond and still comply with our moral and legal duties, as well as reasonable and wise investment policies that guide our board of trustees. 
and it is for that reason that we cannot support the resolution on divestment as it is currently written. The position of the board was voted upon unanimously and can be found on the website at a link entitled Principal Position Statement in Response to the Resolution Urging Divestment from Fossil Fuel Companies. It is followed by frequently asked questions and a representative list of actions taken in response to climate change over the last 25 years by the pension boards through the ICCR. Now, a number of clarifying statements are needed to explain our position and the common criticisms of that position. First of all, it's important to understand that our opposition to the resolution has nothing to do with the validity, the science, the importance, the theological basis or urgency of the climate change issue. If it were so, we would not have a documented history of response to the threat of climate change, nor would ICCR have produced its materials clearly acknowledging that threat and seeking to inform the church and general public both about the danger and extent of climate change and what can be done about it. You will not find a non-technical written piece more definitively describing climate change as an issue than the ICCR's The Price of Denial, a pamphlet which you can download for free from the ICCR.org website. The real issue is that the resolution provides a single action, a single avenue to action, which is divestment. And this avenue absolutely precludes shareholder activism in the resolution as written. If we are to solve the climate change problem, we need every tool at our disposal. We will need government regulation, conservation, and reduction in consumption of fossil fuels, and development of alternative resources. Secondly, our opposition to the resolution has to do with the technical language of the resolution and the unintended consequences of implementing the resolution as written. Assuming that the pension board agrees with the spirit of the resolution in seeking action on climate change, these are items that could be corrected in a committee or a substitute resolution while retaining a strong and vital response by the UCC to climate change and the responsibility of fossil fuel companies. Third, a resolution by General Synod should be broad enough to include the witness and mission of all its constituent ministries and the flexibility for those ministries to respond according to the uniqueness of their particular charters, rather than excluding those who are unable to implement the letter of the resolution due to restrictions. The Pension Board's opposition is not embedded in the lack of sincere concern for the issues at hand, but in the freedom to act in accordance with its purpose. The General Synod should embrace the diverse witness and strategy of the whole church and affirm with thanksgiving the creativity of witness and mission that is almost weekly celebrated in UCC publications and bulletin covers describing such missions. But what specifically in the resolution prompts these particular statements? The resolution as written requires a straight up or down vote on the following items without offering flexibility to the participating constituent, in this case, the pension boards and its own unique setting and charter. First of all, divestment or sale of fossil fuel stocks as designated by carbontracker.com. You will see this in line 151 of the resolution urging divestment. Secondly, a timeline for implementation that is not keyed to the fundamental analytically based indicators in the broad markets that would maximize return on sale of investments or analyze risk of sale or reinvestment in alternative non-fossil fuel stocks or other securities within a five-year window. Third, the substitution and delegation of the duty or the responsibility of the party designated as the fiduciary of the invested funds to a third party that's not related to the creator of the trust or other arrangement, for example, carbon tracker. 
a requirement perhaps unintended that all commingled funds bearing fossil fuel stocks be sold or not added to immediately with the attendant requirement that funds will be limited to reinvestment in a more and potentially more costly limited list of non-fossil fuel bearing commingled funds. Five, the requirement to divest funds when the responsible managers of funds, in this case, the pension board's board of trustees, and perhaps other church-related funds are possibly uninsured, personally liable, and subject to liability for a breach of fiduciary duty. Six, the assets of the pension board are not church-owned assets. Therefore, the general synod lacks authority or jurisdiction to direct the disposition of those funds. The assets of the pension boards belong to the members of retirement plans administered by the pension boards and cannot, as earned compensation, be altered at the direction of general synod. Another way of saying this is that the general synod can no more direct with or without consent how an individual's earned retirement benefit is invested than I or anyone else could tell you how to bank your own personal funds. The pension boards must abide by its legal duty to protect the assets of members according to its socially responsible investment guidelines. The current SRI guidelines provide that PBUCC investment managers should avoid investments in companies or industries that the investment committee has determined adversely affect human rights, contribute to the denial of such rights, or threaten the quality of human life or of the environment, provided that the investment manager is able to identify other investments with the same or superior risk and reward relationships. Well, now, does this mean that the pension board fails to see climate change as a threatening to human life or the environment? Of course not. It means that if we sell such investments, other investments with the same or superior risk and reward relationships have to be identified for reinvestment. Carbon Tracker is simply not able to do that, nor is it legal to delegate that responsibility to them, even if they were. Carbon Tracker is not in the business of rendering investment advice. It is a perfectly good activist site that is in the business of calling attention to those who do business in fossil fuel. They no doubt expect their readers to use their own judgment in managing their response to climate change and not abrogating that responsibility to them or anyone else. The pension boards must abide by a moral duty also to honor the hard work and commitment of a lifetime of service to the church by our clergy and our lay workers. Since pension fund dues are often tied to a percentage of income of clergy, and since their income has not always been commensurate with their contribution to the church, we owe it to these individuals to manage their funds wisely and for the future so that they may retire with some measure of security and dignity. And for these reasons, the pension board cannot delegate responsibility to a third party. But we have to retain that responsibility for the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees pursues a strategy of socially responsible investing that operates within the scope of its legal and moral restrictions. The pension board voted upon and recommended to the Executive Council of General Senate the following language that could be added to resolutions like the one being considered here. In such language, the General Synod would acknowledge the special duties of the directors and trustees of the pension boards or organizations like the pension boards and recognize that they must operate in the sole and exclusive benefit of plan members while at the same time doing everything they can to support the justice and witness of the United Church of Christ to the extent possible. This simple language recognizing the distinctiveness of the pension boards would be a welcome solution to so much debate and misunderstanding, allowing us all to proceed with common purpose and resolve. 
What more could the pension board do to address member and church concerns about the environment? Even now, the board of trustees and staff are evaluating ways of investing positively in alternative energy through social impact investing. The possibility of offering alternative funds to members who choose to accept that option with its attendant risks without affecting the return of members who don't. Evaluating which fossil fuel companies do the worst damage to the environment, like coal and tar sands, which account for 70% of the climate change problem, according to Jeremy Grantham, a well-known environmentalist and investor who supports 350.org, and working with the Socially Responsible Investors Network to identify alternative co-mingled funds that respond to environmental concerns. These are measured responses that keep faith with our members, but prevent us from supporting an up or down vote on legislation that is just too restrictive of our reasonable efforts to respond to environmental concerns. Let me speak now to the resolution on making UCC church buildings more carbon neutral. We fully support this resolution as a legitimate strategy alongside others in addressing climate change. The Pension Boards has its own story to tell with regard to this resolution at its offices at 475 Riverside Drive. Some studies show that 16% of energy consumption is related to lighting. Some estimate that consumption could be cut in half by going from incandescent light to LED. After making this conversion, the ecumenical offices on Riverside where the UCC used to reside, and the pension boards and United Church funds still do, not only significantly reduced electrical consumption, but also resulted in a rebate for over $100,000 from Con Edison in return. Will actions such as these eliminate climate change in and of themselves? Of course not. Are they part of a multi-layered strategy worthy of pursuit? We think so. Now, what is the Pension Board's planning to do about climate change going forward for the 21st century? Well, regardless of the outcome and the votes on the resolutions, the Pension Boards will be moving forward with a renewed program of shareholder activism and climate change, which will continue our previous efforts. There's an increased call among the members of the ICCR to step up a blended combination of positions that focus on the core of the climate debate. Some of the issues that we've been tackling are shareholder resolutions for greenhouse gas emission disclosures by all fossil fuel companies, sustainability reporting, lobbying and political spending reporting, the setting of greenhouse gas emission goals with links to executive compensation, and addressing the issues of fracking and flaring emissions, along with fugitive methane emissions from fracking. But we must urgently raise new central questions about climate change with the business community, and particularly fossil fuel companies. And we can do this through corporate engagement, phasing in a request to any and all companies to address the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reality to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050, and each individual fossil fuels company's plans to get there. A call for companies to support national policy and legislation addressing climate change, to stop lobbying to oppose the EPA work on greenhouse gas emissions and a call on fossil fuel companies to study their stranded carbon assets and the implications for their financial balance sheet and stock prices. This last one is important because what it says is that if fossil fuel companies have large deposits of stranded carbon assets, the value of their stock may go down and they may no longer be a good investment. In addition, pension boards will be joining our ecumenical path partners in a number of corporate resolutions on all of the issues I mentioned, and more that are already pending with companies like Chevron, Emerson Electric, and ExxonMobil. We will continue to pursue alternative investments for a clean environment. We will add our efforts to those in the church who are pursuing other strategies 
and a multi-layered approach to solving problems and honoring God's creation and all that live within it. I really want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I know I've thrown a lot of facts and figures and ideas at you. I fear, though, that we've only scratched the surface of this important topic. And perhaps some of your questions will lead to other avenues of inquiry that are constructive and helpful in this important debate. I leave you with our hope. Our hope in the General Synod to come in its resolutions and in our work together in mission and ministry on climate change and other issues, this is what we really believe. The whole witness of the church is enhanced by pursuing multiple strategies at once, none to the exclusion of the other, and all by each one's ability to act in ways appropriate to the mission and constitution of that particular ministry. Thank you again for joining this webinar and for listening to my talk, and I will now be glad to start uh, taking your uh, questions, and I will be uh, responding to some of those during our time remaining until 1 o'clock. Our first question here comes from Lynn Hansen. If I sell my stock in any offending company, I forfeit my opportunity to have, the de have a voice in the decisions of the board. Uh, please comment. That is correct that one of the aspects of shareholder activism is that you have to own at least enough of a percentage of stock in that company to have shareholder voting rights. And so there are some screens put in place by some uh, institutional investors, faith-based investors, so that they can hold at least some stock to keep on making their voices heard. And as I said before, it's important to know that we're not only talking to the board of directors who we want to change uh, uh, directions on some issues on, but we also want to influence the shareholders that vote in those boards of directors. And we can keep doing that by having a voice in our investments. Question on how does General Synod go about changing a, uh, a resolution if it were inclined to amend the resolution? Well, that's important because there could be a few changes to the existing resolution on divestment that would make it possible for a broader base of support at General Synod, which is what everyone wants after all. And this is done through delegates in committee primarily. Every delegate uh, to the General Senate has an opportunity to serve on a particular committee. They're assigned at random. And in those committees, they can make changes to a resolution. Uh, the standing rules and rules for doing that are complicated, but you can find them in the uh, delegates handbook on the website for the General Senate. Is there a copy of the presentation handout available, one person asks, and yes, there is, and I'm happy to provide that to you if you just leave me your email address uh, or email me for that, and I'd be happy to provide it. You mentioned that Pension Boards was going to be weighing in on two General Senate environmental resolutions, and which is the other resolution. That is the resolution on making our churches carbon neutral. Uh, the reason that we are uh, supporting that resolution is because we want to emphasize to the General Senate and to the delegates and those attending that there is a need for a multi-layered approach. That uh, the day after you have sold all your stock in fossil fuel companies, Climate change is still with us. Uh, and one of the ways of addressing climate change is to therefore address consumption. Uh, so we can make buildings, and uh, such as church buildings, our homes and our businesses more carbon neutral and reduce consumption. Uh, we also need to do work on alternative fuels uh, that are readily available in this country and are cheaper than oil 
but which we have not uh, seen at our pumps when we go uh, over in our conversion to our cars, which is something that will be coming eventually. Uh, another question, will the presentation be recorded so we can access it at a later time? Yes, it is recorded and we will be running the presentation on a loop at uh, some point in our pension board's booth at uh, General Synod. Uh, you could contact our um, uh, Director of Public Relations, uh, Martha Cruz, and she can tell you how to access a recording. Or um, uh, Winona Leakes, who is also uh, a member of our staff who deals with member education. Another question, just to be clear, will the slides be available on the PBUCC website immediately after this presentation? I will check into making that available. I don't know what the technical aspects of that are involved with, but we'll try to make those slides available. There's certainly no reason why we shouldn't. Okay. I'm looking to see... Okay, another question. If it is a illegal, that is a violation of fiduciary responsibility to divest, how were these bodies able to do this in regards to firms in South Africa? That's a great question because there were uh, some uh, faith-based bodies that did some divesting. And those that were able to do that were not pension funds. A pension fund is distinct from other types of church-held funds in that the assets or earned compensation and owned by the retirees. And also because the fiduciary duty or the legal duty to protect those assets is regulated by federal law. Uh, sometimes people find it surprising that church-related plans are regulated by uh, federal law, but they are. And uh, whether you think this is fortunate or unfortunate, church bodies are increasingly uh, coming under more and more governmental regulation. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that the regulations protecting pension fund assets came about as a result of a desire to protect working people from the mismanagement of their retirement funds from unscrupulous parties that might have absconded with their monies. And so the original intent of the legal restriction, which we must now bear as an annuity plan, is uh, actually originated in a basis for protecting uh, working people uh, and their retirement benefits. So just again to answer the question, one of the reasons that we are not able to divest in the same way that some other church faith-based groups might be able to, depending on what their particular charters are, uh, has to do with the special regulation and duty imposed upon uh, church plans. I'm looking to see if we have other questions I haven't gotten to. Okay, question. It appears that a word may be missing in the Our Hope slide and certain lines should some words be inserted after all and before by, for example, all guided by. Uh, that is a, a possible amendment to the statement, uh, but what the statement obviously is intended to say is that uh, an example, I'll just give an example that I often give. If you have three congregations in your conference and all of them are dedicated to the issue of hunger, one church may have a food bank, another church may have a nutrition uh, education program, and another church may have a center for homeless persons uh, who need to acquire a job in order to sustain themselves. We don't go around saying, 
well, we like the food bank, but we don't like the nutrition program, or we like the homeless program, but we don't like the food bank. We embrace all three ministries as important and significant as all bearing on the issue at hand, which is hunger. And so with climate change, there is more than one way to respond to that problem. And when it comes to divestment, it's not so much a criticism of divestment as it is that divestment is the only way to comply with or fulfill the conditions that are stated in the resolution. So if the resolution allowed for a broader stream of strategies to address climate change, including shareholder activism, that would be a positive thing. Also, we're preserving a form of ministry that's important to the UCC. The UCC was a founder in ICCR during the period of apartheid when shareholder activism was one of the important tools being used to bring about change. And if we eliminate that completely from our arsenal of UCC tools in the social justice witness, then we're removing an important traditional piece of our social justice witness. And we don't want that to happen. We want to continue that work. And we will continue that work. I have a question. When has the pension boards divested from stocks and how and why has that occurred? Well, first let me say that divestment is nothing out of the ordinary or unusual. Anytime you sell an investment in order to buy another one or sell it to cash it in, you're divesting. And the issue is when those investments are aimed at protecting the nest egg of a retiree, then when you sell one, you better be able to buy one that will maintain the same level of risk and reward as the one you sold. Now, is it impossible to sell a fossil fuel stock and buy one that is better than the one that you sold? No, that's not impossible, but it has to be done under the right conditions. And specifying which stocks can be sold and which cannot by an arbitrary list in Carbon Tracker is not the best way to go about doing that. Now, the pension boards has divested uh, of other stocks in the past through screening, what's called exclusionary screening. And what that is is uh, saying that we're not going to invest in a particular portion of the market, like tobacco, alcohol, firearms, that sort of thing. Uh, when it comes to fossil fuel stocks, they comprise such a large segment of the total markets uh, that it is very difficult to uh, divest of all of those stocks without making some important and very educated uh, decisions. And that's what we want the flexibility to be able to do, and the resolution does not provide in its current written state. I do not see any further questions at this time, and we're getting close to our time to end the webinar. So I would ask that those of you who still have uh, some questions pending or would like to speak with me, Please, again, feel free to contact me through my email, through my phone, and I'll be uh, present at the Pension Board's booth uh, at General Senate in the Exhibit Hall, and you can leave a message there if you don't see me, and I will uh, promise to get back with you as soon as I can. I really appreciate, again, all of you who participated in this webinar. Hopefully, it has shared some information with you that will help in your understanding. And if you are a delegate and you're voting, then you will be more informed. And if you are a member, uh, we thank you for your participation and uh, for this opportunity to find out about our socially responsible investing guidelines. All right, thanks very much and have a great day today.
This is Rick Walters, and we'll see you.